<coughs> bring a midrash that Rashi also brings, which is connected with the laws of Hanukkah. We you know, as, as I explained, Hanukkah in its significance we don't have it included, the history of it, in the Kitve Kodesh. Although there were also original reports of the Maccabeans, which were in Hebrew, which are well known. And there are many reports by the Greeks of what happened. And Josephus, who is uh, the major Jewish historian of ancient times, you know, he was in the times of the destruction by the Romans, and he knew all their sources, he brings many different sources. <coughs> but in the Talmud, Especially, some in the Midrashim also go into things more extensively, but in the Gomorrah, as we explained yesterday, there is hardly a mention of <coughs> any aspects of the major miracles of Hanukkah, which we do refer to, that's also in the Gomorrah, in the special prayer we say, both in the Amida and in the Birkat Amazon, they will refer to the way in which Hashem gave the men in the hands of the few, describes the, the miraculous victories of the few over the many, of the righteous over the wicked. <coughs> and there are also quite a lot of references in the Gemara and the Midrashim to acts of heroism and to uh, people <coughs> even with torture and with threats preserved the Torah. One of the few places <coughs> where there is a, a Midrash which also brought in Russian Next week's Pasha, the beginning, is the following parable. It says like this. We know at the end of last week's Pasha, there's a long list of the growth of the power of Esau. And there's reference there also to, to the Greek period, which is the power of Esau in the Roman period. <coughs> and Iran, mentioned there as one of the descendants, is regarded as another name for Rome. It's the same basic letters in Hebrew. So when Yaakov Avinu, he foresaw the enormous power of Esau, how it's going to develop, since we've often explained Masa Vatsiman the Banim, the episodes concerning Yaakov do not only refer to him as a person, it refers to the whole Beit Yaakov, the whole people of Israel. So he was terrified. How will the Jewish people be able to survive when there are all these big forces of the world, the superpowers want to extinguish the power of Am Yisrael. <coughs> so Rabbi Levi says that Eile Todot Yaakov Yosef. The offspring of Yaakov is Yosef. In other words, it is through the continuity of the enormous power of Yaakov who founded the people of Israel. 
but it's the enthusiasm of the next generation that will be able to retain their righteousness even if they're surrounded by idolatrous superpowers. It can be compared to a blacksmith whose forge opens the city square and the door of the worship, worship workshop of his son, who's a goldsmith, was open opposite the forge of the blacksmith. One day the blacksmith saw bundle upon bundle of thorns being brought into the town. And he exclaimed in dismay, where will all these bundles go? There was an intelligent individual standing there and he said to the blacksmith, you're afraid of all these thorns that are going to burn up your shop. One spark from you, from your forge, blacksmith, and one spark from your sons, who's got the goldsmith's forge, and you will burn them up entirely. So also, when our forefather Yaakov, he saw Esau and his chieftains, he became afraid. <clears throat> so the Holy One blessed me, said to him, of these men you are afraid. One spark will issue from your forge, and one spark will issue from your sons, and you'll burn them all up. As the Prophet says, O your Beit Yaakov Eish, the house of Jacob will be fire, and the house of Yosef will be a flame, and the house of Asaph a straw. They will ignite them and consume them. Now, the usual interpretation of this is, especially as this similar parable is brought in connection <coughs> with this <coughs> Mishnah concerning Hanukkah. That what happens if a person he kindles a Hanukkah light and uh, <coughs> if he, <coughs> he's going <coughs> to and, and there comes through a, a camel loaded with a lot of straw with horns going right through the streets and he kindled a Hanukkah light as my husband should do to start with facing the street. <coughs> so a person had the whole question, what happens? What happens if it's not Hanukkah? And he, he goes and puts a light in the face of the street, and as a result, the whole camel load becomes burnt up and spreads to a house and burns down the house. Is he liable or not? He's liable. Oh, just a minute. And all <coughs> if it's not Hanukkah, it's just a during the year and he and and he's not so careful enough with the lights that are outside, then we say it's his light that kindles the thorns of the of the that are being loaded up on the camel or the straw. Then he's irresponsible. Whatever is Hanukkah. Hanukkah when he's permitted to put a light that goes into the street. Then, then there's a more different question. Since he's permitted to do it, we're speaking about a Jewish city, Jewish area, and everyone knows if it goes through a street, it's got to be careful. Then there's, then there's a whole discussion whether he's liable or not liable. It's a halakha question. That's brought right in the middle of the laws of Hanukkah. So also it's brought here in this, in, in this Midrash, which Rashi brings also. Rashi brings the same Midrash. <coughs> so therefore some say the concept is, what's it got to do with Hanukkah? Because the, the, especially the Shloa Kodesh goes into this in, in, whole, in its whole structure of this coming week's Shvasha. says that the Yaakov Avinu represents the origin of the Jewish light of Torah. Because that's the fire, that's the coal. But is the younger, later younger generations have the power of enthusiasm, who will go and make sure that they are, in, in Hebrew, the word for enthusiasm is lahavut, which also means enflaming. The glowing coal of Yaakov, 
will be transformed through the next generation represented by Yosef, who even when he was a young man and he was surrounded by uh, big forces of seduction to turn to idolatry, to turn to hedonism, and to give up his, also his moral purity, but he resisted everything. This is what helped Yosef to survive as a member of Yaakov's family and descendants in an estranged environment. And similarly, the time of the Hellenists, when also, many times, all the way through Jewish history, is the younger generation that can use the traditions, which is the glowing coal, and transform them into a flame of light that will drive away the darkness. If you say, Ma'at Mina'or, a little bit of light could drive away all the darkness of the Galut, all the confusion, the assimilation, and the immorality, and the dis destruction of the divine image of the human being, that's darkness. A little light of Torah can illuminate the darkness. And that's the concept of the Hanukkah in the middle of the winter when it's dark. That's one interpretation. But I'd like to bring you first a beautiful interpretation of a <coughs> person who was both my Rebbe and my Chavrusa, one of the great Musa teachers of the previous generation, Rav Shlomo Wolbe. He said like this. He said, what's the significance of the spark that goes out from Yaakov and becomes a flame through your safe? He says like this. This is a reference. It says, Nitz, one expression is, one spark will go out from Yosef, which will destroy and burn up all the house of Asaph, which is called Kash. That's just because what it says in the verse, the house of Yaakov will be a fire, the house of Yosef will be a flame, and the house of Asaph will just be straw and stubble. One spark goes out from Yosef, which will burn up all the stubble of Asa, all these big alufim, these big superpowers. Which is another way of saying that despite um, the enormous superpowers of the idolatrous Seleucids, Seleucids, the, the <coughs> pers persecution from the corrupt aspect of the Greeks and the torturous massac massacres of the Romans, but the Jewish people's light will continue even when mankind has seen the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So Rehobo says this, he says, this is a reference to the days of the Mashiach, because the spark that goes out from Yosef what will it do? It's a reference to the spiritual power of the people of Israel. He says, one analyzes it, the wisdom of the nations of the world depends upon Israel. The Kuzari, one of the major Jewish philosophers, explains that the Gentiles, most of their scientific wisdom they ha had it inspired, and also the base of it, from Am Israel. We find that when there's a certain quality that has been developed by the, the <coughs> spiritual leaders contained amongst Am Israel, after a certain time, you'll find it percolating to the nations of the world to develop a certain scientific attitude and also a philosophic attitude, but it takes its origin from the Jewish people. He says, Socrates and Aristotle, they came after the period of prophecy amongst the people of Israel. In a certain way, the, we can say the the grandeur and glory of Greece, which was 
demonstrated by the great philosophers, this was a shadow, a shade, a reflection of the period of prophecy amongst the people of Israel. I'm, I'm, I'll add to these words of Revolver the following, that in fact it's shown by Aristotle himself who told Alexander the Great, whilst you're transforming the whole of the Middle East and also North Africa and other places to remove themselves from barbarism and primitivism and, and accept uh, more Greek ideas on a higher level, but don't try to change Judea, as it was called then, because there you find greater wisdom. And even uh, it's well known that all the Greek early writings, they say that it was Kadmos, even Mikedem from the East, that they came knowledge of the alphabet, the Greek alphabet is based on the Hebrew alphabet, that one knows, the old Hebrew script is transformed, not just the alphabet, also the literature. And certainly, it was the Septuagint, that means the translation of the Tanakh, that was a great force in, develop, in, in the growth of Greek philosophy. And... Um, Ptolemy himself, I mean, he, he was, he was, he, why, why was he so keen that it should be translated? Because he, he had these traditions as well, this is a source of wisdom. So, and then he goes on, he says, you find something similar in Christianity. Because what's the origin of Christianity? I mean, there are, in the uncensored versions of the Gomorrah, which have also been published in Chesmot Hashas. There are many references to the origin of Christianity because uh, it's, it's the most authentic report that we have concerning Jesus was that he was a disciple of Yeshua ben Prachia. But he started mocking at some of the Called them the rabbinical traditions. And that's why he left the Beit HaMidrash. Nevertheless, many, I would say, the moral ideas, some they went to, it's, it's even, let's say, even it's well known that the, the, the debate, some say, between Archibor and Akiva, <coughs> If there are two people, and <laughs> it, other, in one of them has a jug of water, which can save his life, if he's going to split it with his fellow traveller, which is perhaps from moral point of view, from point of view, you should love your fellow man just like yourself, just to split it, but it means they're both going to die. <clears throat> if one of them will drink it, maybe he'll survive, but the other one will die. So it says Ben Petura, some say Ben Petura means the son of the loose woman, which is perhaps the reality of the so-called virgin birth. In other words, the mother, <coughs> the holy mother was a bit unholy. Ben Petura means like a, a woman who is, uh, who's, as it were, ownerless. <coughs> so um, Ben Petura said no. Love is greater than life. Better they both die, and one shouldn't see the death of his fellow traveller. And so Rabbi Kiva said, no, if it's a question of life and death, then your life comes first. You have to your life's not yours, it's given to you by Hashem. Because if you're going to say you should give it to his fellow traveller, so that what, what fellow traveller will give it back to him, he'll say, what do you mean, it's yours. If you're going to follow the principle, one shouldn't see the death of his fellow. So the solution is, you're, there is a certain aspect of preservation of the self, which is a command of the Torah. That, that, that also is the answer to the questions we discussed concerning pacifism. So he said, so this came through to 
I would say the rest of the world, certain moral principles came <coughs> from the people of Israel, from the Ten Commandments and the way in which they percolated and also the Noahide laws to the nations of the world. Now also, people generally think that the person who really uh, developed and understood the power of the subconscious mind, that was discovered by, by Freud and Adler. But a couple of generations before, Rabbi Sroth Salanta based his whole Musa teaching on how a person can influence the subconscious mind. And he was, writes about it. So it really, it's mentioned, the first place where it's mentioned and developed is in the writings of Rabbi Sroth Salanta, the Musa movement. And there it's developed in many moral ways. And then it, became, then it came through to the nations of the world. In other words, it's life, we should know. The conscious life is to some extent emotionally uh, influenced by the subconscious instincts. And he says, this concept that truth comes to the nations of the world from the Hebrew of Israel will be recognized at the time of the Mashiach. So the smallest chapter of Tehillim is chapter 115, which is as follows. All you nations have to praise God. Why? Because the loving kindness of Hashem has come upon us, the people of Israel, and what has it produced? Emes Hashem Olam. It produced the truth, the true guiding aspect of life on a high level of morality, which is absolute truth, that remains forever. And that the nations will recognize in the time of the Mashiach. If he says, this is the concept of this Midrash. This is the spark of God from Yaakov and Joseph. It says the book of Bereshis, Genesis, which is the book of the roots of creation, reveals this. Because when there is light and holiness for the people of Israel, aspects of it, they enter into the non-Jewish world. And this Nitzot, it may just be a spark, but its influence becomes great amongst the nations. So it may be that uh, the, amongst the Jewish people there are those who dedicate themselves to the, to the saintliness which can be produced through the study of the Torah and fulfillment of the mitzvot and this energy enters, doesn't, does not become nullified. Just like we know the principle of what's called materialistic energy. The, it's called the the, the way that energy is never destroyed. It becomes transformed into a different form, from one form to another form. So this applies even more so to spiritual energy. It, cont it continues to make an important impact on the rest of the world. So the basis of the true wisdom of the nation of the world is those aspects which they can gain from the people of Israel, spiritual power of mankind, this passes via Adam, Noah, Avram, Yitzchok to Am Yisrael. And that's the way in which we, the people of Israel, become the heart of the high development of mankind. So, you know, there's been many books written on the Jewish contribution to civilization. And uh, I mean, those who are not affected by uh, transforming their jealousy for this into hatred, they recognize it. And by the contribution, it's well known and can't be denied by anyone when it comes to intellectual contributions in uh, the enormous aspects of higher philosophy and science 
the ratio of Jews involved in this and developing it until today is greater than amongst uh, any of the other groups of mankind, but it applies equally and for more important aspects to the preservation of the divine image in the human being. I think it's a, this is the most beautiful interpretation to which I'd just like to add a few remarks from Rav Hutner, who, who, who speaks about this, <coughs> that um, he says, Jacob is referred to as a fire and Joseph as a flame. Just as the flame extends the fire, so to Joseph extends Jacob, Yaakov. But Yaakov, the fire burns in its place. Once a Jew comes into existence, it's impossible for his sacred line of Jewishness to be extinguished. It's, it's there, something is hidden. Church is the flame that allows the fire to reach far away, to later descendants until the end of time. They should be Jewish. Church was completion of Jacob's mission. In other words, you do find there's many Jews who don't exemplify uh, development of saintliness, but deep inside is hidden in them, and maybe it doesn't come out right away. But in due course, you find many where the the, the we call it the Jewish spark was apparently lost, and then it comes up again to the grand or great grandchildren. The middle of Seat Joseph is the nemesis of Esau, although it says Yaakov and Esau who have the seesaw relationship. When one rises, the other falls. It is Yosef who secures Yaakov's position in the confrontation with Esau because he seals the chink in Yaakov's armor before Esau. So as he explains, so that, that's, that's a, a hopeless remark on this. you have any questions? I have a question. Yes. Yesterday you were talking about Hanukkah. It's from Rab Rabbanut. It's not from uh, the Torah. So, so where would you, you draw a line or, or say this is tradition and this is religion? Where would you draw the line between what is religion and what is tradition? It depends what you mean by those words because <laughs> anyone who wants to describe Judaism, mm -hmm. you will say the traditions of Judaism are the religion of Judaism. But some things you find in, in rabbinical, uh, like, like a good example, is Hanukkah is not found in the Torah. Well, yes and no. It's not found explicitly in the Torah. The Torah is a book of prophecy. It's like hidden. And then some things mentioned explicitly, and others are mentioned in hints. So, Hanukkah, as we just already described, for example, the, the, the concept of Hanukkah in um, that uh, it was just connected with the rededication of the temple after it had been contaminated is also hinted on the same day it turns out that the work of setting up the first sanctuary was completed on Hanukkah. Then, as you know, on, on Hanukkah we read concerning the Hanukkah Tamizbeach, the, the dedication of the altar, which was the 12 days, but those are the 12 days which uh, existed in the first instance, the first Mizbeach, from the first of Nisan. But what do we do on Hanukkah? We read from the Torah from the Hanukkah Tamizbeach. Because really it was a rededication. In other words, we have in the Chumash, we have this concept, if you want to understand the Chumash more thoroughly, Masa Avot Siman Lebanem. The matters that took place in the days of the forefathers, whether it was Avram Yitzhak Yaakov and Yosef, or whether it was Moshe Rabbeinu and Am Yisrael in the desert, which it's a recurring pattern. It's like the seeds of the pattern of the development 
of Amisra, referred to also as a dynamic tree. It's the history of Amisra. Ki me eight, like the days of a tree. You have heard that we, we, we produce fruit, and it's, it's not that it's made static, it grows again, even though the tree goes through winter or where it seems to be more or less dead, but it comes alive again. As we're seeing to, for example, it's not just a simple comparison when even detailed analysis have been made of the parallel between the initial persecution of the Jewish people in Egypt and, 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 the, and the Holocaust. And it says in the prophets as well, like in the days when I took you out from Egypt, I will take you out from the dispersion, the suffering which you can have from all the nations of the world. So here we have a parallel from the Chumash, which is, you, you, you're calling the Chumash as you're calling it religion, that's what we mean by the source of the religion. And we see that it also explains all the traditions, that it, there is here, these are the seeds of the tree. And when in, when in the seed level, you can't see them so well. But afterwards, you see that in the life of the Jewish people, those seeds become developed into, into the trees and into fruit. What's in the root is in the fruit. And uh, that part of the concept of the unity between the past and the future, which is really even the basis of the language in which the Chumash was written. In other words, the Chumash is written in the language that the past contains the seeds of the future. And similarly also with the so-called oral tradition. The Torah Shabbat Peh, the reason why it's, one of the reasons it's oral is because it's transforming the text into life. The text is a sacred text. It's a text of the Tanakh. And there are many people investigating it, but you can leave the text in the cupboard on the Aron HaKodesh and take no notice of it. So that's why we have the oral tradition, which is dependent upon the principles of the text and the prophets being translated into the stream of life of the Jewish people from one generation to the next. That's, that, that's why it says in the Chumash already, there's this, this, it's mentioned it, when, it, when we explained yesterday why, particularly with Hanukkah, which is a festival, where there's no men, explicit mention of it in any books of the Bible, it's only a hint, but in the Bible already says the concept of continuity, that who's to lead the people of Israel in later generations when you may have no prophets? You have to see the wisest men of the oral tradition, who keep it alive, who make sure it's not a dead text, a text which is kept in museums and maybe in archives and maybe even in universities to be studied as a subject of the past or in a museum where you look at it from the past, no, you've got to translate it into life of each generation by going to the biggest sages of the time who carry on the oral tradition. Any other question? Yes, okay. Hanukkah. The period of the revolt of the Maccabees until the time of the Romans was relatively a short period of time in terms of the history of mankind, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. As we say, colloquialism, that was like a, a spit in the ocean. The end was that the Romans came, massacred people, took the survivors in chains, tortured. What difference does it make today? What spiritual message do we have today from Hanukkah? Besides Mausur, we light some candles, we eat some uh, latkes, that kind of thing. It wasn't Mount Sinai, so what spiritual message was different in that revolution? The Iranians revolted, the Americans, the Chinese, everyone revolted against power, and they succeeded. What 
is different about Hanukkah today that's spiritual other than the symbolism that we do. Look, I think the, 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 the relevance of Hanukkah for today is, is, is illustrated by the resistance of a minority of the Jewish people today against the enormous forces of assimilation. Uh, there's no question that um, the preservation of Jewish life under the communists in the Stalinist period was very much affected by the kindling of Hanukkah. Other than Hanukkah, we, we go, we continue with the message, whatever big powers want to destroy Judaism, whatever big powers of, powers of persuasion come upon the vast majority of Jews today to have nothing to do with Judaism and to intermarry, it says no, no point in remaining Jewish. But we continue in the way of kindling the light. We constantly, when we kindle the light, we kindle the light of the menorah, we kindle the light of the Torah. We're keeping it alive. You can even put it together with the miracle of Hanukkah was hinted at already with the Western light, as it described in the previous shura. When the, when the wandering in the desert from place to place is a premonition, as it says in the Prophets, of the wandering of the Jewish people from nation to nation. Which, unfortunately, has brought about also in our time, as in the time of the Hellenists, for the majority of the Jewish people to become, like, become lost amongst the other nations. But the remnant has always remained and not become lost. Why? Because of the power of the Torah. The Western lamp had, didn't have enough oil, didn't have enough oil put in to last for 24 hours, could only last overnight. But it went on for 24 hours. So the, what, what does it say in the Midrash about that light? It says, that was testimony, that was the proof that the Shekhinah rests amongst the people of Israel. For whom was it a proof? For all mankind. They look in the, 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 the discussion, the Gemara concerning Hanukkah, the light of Hanukkah, which is represented by the Western lamp, was proof to the whole world that the Shekhinah does not depart of the people of Israel. We have the ability to link up with the Creator of the world and to keep a life in the light of the Creator of the world and His teaching to keep that going despite all efforts, despite all situations of Jews or non-Jews to extinguish it. It does not become extinguished. I think that's an enormous lesson for it's so important today when most Jews don't realize it but that's, what kept, that's what's kept Jews alive both under communism and under Iranian persecution and on all the threats. Let's know what's happened now in Berlin. I mean, it's terrible, you know, the, in, in Berlin itself. There was a, there was a, 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 a pigua which killed a lot of people. I mean, main long Jews, but the one Jew, just, it hadn't found them all yet. It happened last week. So we see the power of Esau is stronger today much stronger today than it was after the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, it would have appeared the nation of the world have woke, woken up and we're not, when we won't see Nazism again. But uh, Nazism today is, is, is widespread. And aspects of Nazism is also involved the Jewish people. So it's more important today than any time to keep the light burning. 
And this is when when we when that's why we say we kindle the light of Hanukkah, where the same miracle occurred. One little light can become eight lights and become millions of lights. That does to keep it going. And we Hashem, we we see that uh, I mean there are places. Baruch Hashem, what's happened in communist Russia was unbelievable. If you just think back, it, when I was a youngster, and I, you, I, I, you had to go, I went to Russia and was still under the communists. Everyone's underground. And today, in Russia, you, they can put up uh, Hanukkiot all over, and even the, 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 on basic of the non-Jewish world, they recognize the contribution to civilization of the Jewish people who are continuing their Judaism in a wide sense. Today there is Shivat and there's, there's this Jewish education. It's, revival, it's this enormous revival of, of Judaism for the Russian Jews. All there's been under communism. In America, uh, you can't call it a revival because there is a, there is a, there is a movement Mainly, mainly with Sartre and Lukavich and with others of spreading the light of Torah in different ways. Unfortunately, the forces of simulation in America are, are very strong. And there there's, uh, there there's uh, the rate of intermarriage simulation is going up all the time. So we need the light of Hanukkah to inspire people to come back. You see, it's not... Uh, if you read them, perhaps the best book or American style written concerning uh, the Jewish way of life is by Herm Wook, who's a very famous general novelist in America, and he became a part of Shuba. And he wrote a book called This Is My God. How is it introduced? It's introduced with Hanukkah. So it shows how Hanukkah can be a trigger to get people to wake up, There's people also, if, they, if they, they see they see a Hanukkah, even they see it all. When I went to go to America, in many of the subways and so on, they had, they had an Xmas tree, but next to the Hanukkah, people the Hanukkah has become widely known. And it, if you just look at it as a ritual like the Xmas tree, well, then it's not going to change you, especially if you if you can have them both in your house. But, uh, <laughs> but if you if if you ask if many non-Jews they'll ask them what's the, what's the role about why do you have such a menorah what is it so that's uh, that, the 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 light of the Hanukkah can also bring a spark of return of the Jew to come to the true light of the Torah. Okay. But, uh, tomorrow you're going to have a talk from well, a son who's, who's uh, quite a, 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 a... I know you've heard from Yishai, but I've heard another son giving a talk tomorrow at 9.30. My son Yitzchak, who's, who's uh, one of the top uh, Hebrew writers in many of the newspapers. Also in Ami, the, the, the magazine Ami that just translates his, his, his reports of what's going on a deep way into English, but in the Hebrew weekend magazines, he's uh, one of the top writers. So he's going to speak also today about significance of Hanukkah, and you can let's see what he, he what he can also answer the questions. Good. Okay. 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 Okay.